All right. Um, so basically, a lot of you guys have had some data modeling issues that uh, relate to normal form. And um, I've mentioned this in private meetings. It's maybe t a good time to talk about what it really is. OK, so we deal with this. First of all, we deal with this for a variety of reasons. I guess you're going to get this in your database course more formally. Um, it is a beloved subject in academic courses because it has a patina of formalism, and it's easy to test. Um, so if you tell people that you took a database course and that you don't know what third normal form is, they're not going to respect you. Um, you know, a lot of the ideas will seem like common sense. Um, and you've probably been doing some of this stuff naturally. There is an issue, though, that I want you to think about, because things like Postgres and Oracle 8 actually bring back some of these dead issues, these issues that were thought to be dead with the relational database. So we're going to look at it. All right, so what's abnormal? I got a friend, Shai knows him, who's uh, orthodox. And uh, he had a big crush, maybe it was 10 years ago, on Winona Ryder. Because uh, she was actually born in Winona Horowitz. Um, so one of the few Jewish movie actors, actresses, I guess, or anyway, one of the few that appealed to him. Um, so this is basically you know, what he would do. So if he was going to be with a WAP phone at the Academy Awards and want to get hold of her filmography, you know, he might uh, build a table sort of like this. Age of Innocence, 1993. Here's the producer. Here's the director. But notice there's three writers here separated by commas. Um, so basically, if you show this to Winona, she's going to say, hey, these data aren't even in first normal form. Notice that she has a touch of pedantry about her <coughs> and refers to data as plural. Um, so what does she mean? Um, well, first normal form means there's basically one value in every at every intersection of a row and a column. So if you have three values at an intersection of a row and a column, then uh, you don't even have first normal form, which is the beginning of normality. Uh, it can also be called a repeating group or a multi-valued column. OK, so what's the problem? Well, the Varchar 4000 data type might be too small if you keep adding writers to a project. So one reason this is a problem, at least in old databases, is that you have the potential to run over your uh, limits. That's not a big deal with something like um, Oracle and a CLOB column that can handle 4 gigabytes. However, you have to think that, uh, as I said, the table name, column name, and key value no longer specifies a datum. That's going to require programmers to do a lot more thinking than they're accustomed to. Insert, update, and select are no longer sufficient to manipulate multi-valued columns. So you can't use these operations to um, replace, say, this Jay Cox guy with somebody else or Martin Scorsese with somebody else. You basically have to use, presumably you will eventually use an update, but in the meantime, you're going to have to use procedural language of some sort to do a regular expression, to split this thing by commas, to do a whole bunch of text processing operations that aren't in the SQL language. Um, now, of course, in something like Oracle, where you can import Java libraries and run Java code, nothing keeps you from doing these things. but it's out of the realm of what has traditionally been considered SQL programming, and it gets into you know general programming of a Turing machine. Um, programmers' brains will have to adapt to dealing simultaneously with unordered data in table rows and ordered data inside a multi-valued column. So basically, once you're a SQL programmer, you get into this mindset where you just get sets back from the database a set of rows, and you don't assume that it's going to come back in any particular order. That's kind of a way of thinking about it. And you can do an order by if you want it to be ordered. But otherwise, you're always dealing with unordered sets. 
Um, here, mentally, there's a bit of an overhead because you're dealing with, you know, this is item zero, this is item one, this is item two, and, they ha and they're positional. So it's a different way of thinking. Uh, there's a design opacity issue. If you use multi-volume value columns even once, other people who look at your code will never know what to expect when they start digging. You know, are you, did you use multiple tables to express a many-to-one relation or a multi-valued column? They'll never understand what you did and why. You know, maybe sometimes you use a separate table with, you know, three rows per writer, as we see down here. Right? In this case, we have movie writers, separate table, and we have, you know, three rows for uh, Age of Innocence. So they'll never really know. Did you do it this way? Or did you use these whizzy new Oracle features for modeling one-to-many relationships? Oracle supports two collection data types, VRAs and nested tables. For example, a purchase order has an arbitrary number of line items, so you might want to put the line items into a collection. VRAs have a maximum number of elements, although you can change the upper bound. The order of elements is defined. Nested tables can have any number of elements, and you can select with regular tables. The order of the elements is not defined. Nested tables are stored in a storage table with every element mapping to a row in a storage table. If you need to loop through an order, store a fixed number of items, use VArrays. If you need to run efficient queries on collections, arbitrary numbers of elements, then use nested tables. So an Oracle, if you look carefully at the object relational part of Oracle, it's not really object relational. It's like Postgres hierarchies and table inheritance. It's more really of just having these extra data types of collections. Uh, you can see there's all kinds of weird new syntax they've introduced into SQL to manipulate these multi-valued columns. But a database purist, you know, would say, so here I say that Winona Ryder playing Abigail said that I am but God's finger. This is in the crucible. If you would contend Elizabeth, she will be contend. Arguments against normalization continue to sway practitioners. Fabian Pascal says that this costs dearly and reveals the poor understanding of sound database principles by even those who profess to be experts in the field. <coughs> Obviously, the people who wrote that stuff above or the underlying systems are experts at Oracle. It is both a major reason for and a consequence of deficiencies in SQL implementations and for, uh, and for technology regressions such as ODBMS and OLAP that have come to, come to haunt SQL databases in the town of Salem. I think Fabian Pascal actually said most of this, um, talking about things like uh, those Oracle collections and VRAs. All right, let's move on to second normal form. So let's say you're going to give talks, three different talks, how to pick up Jewish babes in Hollywood, how to get a seat at the Academy Awards using SQL expertise, what I learned about normalization from Winona Ryder. Um, so you end up with a talks table and events table. So basically you're gonna say, look, there's gonna be three rows in here for my three different talks with my name and the, my biography. And then there's gonna be one row every time we give a talk in a different city, sort of like my one day courses. So and this refers to um, each event refers to one specific talk. Okay, and then we store venue name, street address, city, country code. So this is in first normal form. There are no multi-valued columns. Um, there are some issues though. Let's say you fly into New York. I, this is an issue I raise and give each of your three talks over three days. Um, you're gonna be duplicating the venue information three times. Uh, you'd have to update it in three places if the street address changed. If you use a new venue and you want to enter the street address, um, you've got nowhere to store the information unless you've already got an event scheduled. If there's only one event in the database with a particular venue's information and you delete it, then you lose, in addition to the information about what time the event is, um, you lose the information about the venue. So second normal form would have you break things up into talk, venue, events, um, 
so second normal form says all columns are functionally dependent on the whole key. I forget what that means anymore. Um, it's very hard to think about this stuff. Um, functionally dependent on the whole key, and down here in third normal form, you're directly dependent on the whole key. Um, it's, I think it's more, it's more interesting to, um, I think it's more interesting to think about things that you can't do and that you're at risk of doing when databases are in certain form. So in first normal form, you're at risk, like I said, of having duplicated data, and you're at risk of duplicating stuff that you didn't necessarily, of deleting stuff you didn't necessarily want to delete while deleting something else. So basically, each table isn't uh, about one kind of thing. So in first normal form, um, this events table actually had information about two different kinds of objects in it. The event itself, like when it starts, and uh, the street address of the venue. And that leads us into all those problems. Whereas if you get into second normal form, um, there's some kind of key that determines all non-key column values. So, you know, in this case, the event ID is a key, or the talk ID might be a key with the start time and end time, but it doesn't really determine the venue um, information. Here, okay, venue ID basically determines all this other stuff. The event ID determines all the other information here in the uh, events table. Any data model in second normal form is also in first normal form. So uh, there's, it goes right up to fifth normal form, which I really don't understand. Um, but you know, something in fifth normal form is in fourth normal form, and something in fourth normal form is in third, second, and first normal forms. So that's how it works out. Um, third normal form is getting to be a little bit fancy, and you might not even want to bother with it. Um, so basically, Third normal form gets sort of functional dependencies. So let's go back to events. We have start time, end time, and ticket price. Let's suppose that secretly behind the scenes, there was a function that you were using to set the ticket price. And the ticket price was solely a function of the length of the talk. So you're going to charge you know, a dollar per minute per talks. If that's true, then even though you haven't changed anything in your data model, it's not considered to be in third normal form because of that functional dependency. And what you would have to do is create a table, you know, called ticket price that would store, you know, some set of prices that you could then use to determine the price of a talk or maybe price per minute in your application or something. I'm not going to talk about fourth and fifth normal forms because, like I said, I don't really understand them. Uh, there's a pretty good book by this Fabian Pascal guy. I really ought to reference it, but I don't. Hey, how did Michael Booth get his name on this? So sec is second normal form all about referencing then so that you can make a change in one table and have it reflected in any table that deals um, with that? Like ref ref referring to a separate table where there's common information in different tables? Can you repeat that question? Um, the example, I think, was the, if the location changes you currently have to go change it in three different tables. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it was in second normal form, you'd be, the whole point I'm asking it is, is the whole point just so that you can make that change in one place so they each reference a locations table and there's no place to change it. Basically, in a transaction, right, in a transaction processing system, um, you certainly care about stuff like that. You only want to make updates in one place on the disk. So people are very concerned about that. And in fact, when we get next week into the data warehousing lecture, you'll see that uh, some of these ideas get thrown out the window um, in order to get super efficient retrieval in the data warehouse because at that point you don't care about how long it takes to do updates. You're doing updates you know, overnight in a huge batch and you're leaving the data. And archive, you know, old data never changes. Um, I think there is more of the risk though, instead of the efficiency, the risk really is more of leaving something behind that you, if you have your venue information spread out not just in the events table, but in a bunch of other places. You know, if the zip code changes, or actually text square, they just changed it from 545 to 200 for no particularly good reason. I don't know. 
And uh, yeah, you shouldn't have to go basically poking around in your database, finding 15 different tables and 10,000 different rows and update it everywhere. I wanted you to know that uh, at ver very least, first normal form is an important thing. If you're going to violate it by using these multi-valued column features, don't necessarily assume that just because a database vendor gives you these features that you should use them. That you know it's a new and shiny technology, and of course it must be better. There's plenty of really hardcore database people who would say that it's an abomination, and every value should be the intersect should be specified by table name, column name, and key. Um, which I think um, I think there's a lot of good I think there's a lot of value to that idea that basically um, you can't really know how your data are going to be used going down the road. So you might I mean I'll give you an example right. You might say, well, I want a person's address to be balled up into a little address object, and I'm going to create a column of type address and store you know street name, city, zip code, all that other stuff in there. Well, that's great, except that if you think that you're always going to pull that out in a big monolith, but it, you know, if you say, well, I want to count up, I'm going to group my users by zip code or group my users by a fraction of a zip code, now you're having to go look in the manual for all the special SQL syntax for reaching inside the address object. And it probably would be cleaner just to leave them in separate columns, as we did. OK. Um, Let's just talk a little bit about sort of under the hood at Oracle. Um, let me give you some examples. Um, of how subtle transaction problems can be. So here's a good example. Here's a refer log we had. So to figure out when a user came in from a foreign URL to a local URL, uh, on a particular date, we wanted to count, say, the number of people coming in from, say, the Yahoo Photography section to Photo.net's, um, I don't know, uh, oh, homepage. So basically, we didn't want to have a row for every click from Yahoo, because that would be too much. But we wanted to have a count for each day, so we could at least graph the number of referrals from Yahoo over time to that particular page. All right, um, and we create a refer index on refer log, local URL, foreign URL, entry date. So that makes it very fast to ask the question, show me, well, it's extremely fast to ask the question, um, you know, give me the count for today, given the home page and Yahoo. It also makes it very fast to ask the question, uh, show me all the referrals into this particular page on photo.net. This doesn't help you if you want to say, show me all the places from, a from the New York Times or from this particular page in the New York Times that point into photo.net. That would still require a full table scan because this occurs second in the index. So unless you're doing a query where the where clause contains local URL, this index isn't going to apply. All right, so that's compound index as we talked about the other day. Um, here's the script. So basically, it runs as an AOL server filter. And here's a little trick that we use. This runs on every request to photo.net. So first of all, you want that code to be pretty efficient. We're getting down here. I think by the time we've gotten down here, we've already figured out that it's an external refer. So. It's already well known that this is actually a, a, an event worth logging. It's not just uh, an internal re reference. So you know, there's a lot of internal references. If you have an article on uh, photographic light with a bunch of images, inline images, all those are going to come through with a refer header. The browsers, by the way, it's part of the HTTP standard. The browser tells the server what page it was last on. And it's an interesting inf piece of information if the page it was last on was somewhere other than your site. It's not very interesting if it's somewhere on your site. It might be interesting for click-throughs, but you know, on photo.net, if there's 20 photos that appear in a particular article, uh, as soon as they request the article, you know that you're going to get 20 more requests, each one with a refer header saying that, OK, the last thing I was doing was reading this article. All right, so here we ask for a database handle, but we do it with a timeout of minus 1, that special syntax to AOL server. 
saying if all the database connections are used, don't give me one. Throw an error instead. So this lets the server ride peaks of usage gracefully. This is information that we'd like to log. It's nice to log it. But if all eight database connections are already busy serving real users for real things, there's no reason for us to block and then grab one of these and use it. Um, we'll just return filter OK and let the thread um, let the thread expire. This, by the way, is run as a trace filter. So it's run after uh, a page is served rather than a post-auth or pre-auth filter, which run before the page is served and have the property that they can. First of all, they will make the user wait for his page. And secondly, they can abort service of the page in case you think this person shouldn't have access. All right, if you get a database connection, um, we may want to reduce it down with a glob pattern. Sometimes we actually, you know, the refers that come through from, say, um, Google.com, they can include the whole user's search string or something. And you, you don't want to log. Each one of those would end up being logged as a separate row, which is what we said we didn't want. So in this case, we say, OK, if it matches Google.com star, then we smash that down and log the foreign refer as just Google. All right, anyway, so we figure this out. Then we issue an update. We say update the referrer log, set the click count equals click count plus one, where local URL is local URL. Notice this is bad old code from photo.net from before the AOL server Oracle driver was able to accept bind variables. So we're just building up a tickle string. Um, NSCon URL is asking the web server you know, what local URL was requested. And then we um, notice that in Oracle, we can't just say where entry date equals sysdate because that's going to be precise to the second. And I'll never select any rows. So we have to truncate both the entry date and the sysdate down to uh, midnight um, on uh, whatever day this is. OK, so we update the refer log to increment the click count. So you guys might say, well, how does that work? What if there isn't an entry already for this day? Well, what we do is we ask the Oracle driver, how many rows did you update? You've sit in C equal plus, right? And you do an update statement, and you see that it says six rows touched. Um, well, that information, C equal plus is an Oracle client. AOL server is an Oracle client. They have equal status. So any information that's available to C equal plus is available to um, AOL server. So we ask AOL server using the NS underscore aura API call. How many rows were touched? If the answer is zero, we do an insert into the referrer log, local URL, foreign URL, trunk of sysdate, and then a one to start off the number of clicks. OK. Um, all right, anybody have any comments about this? What is it that you're doing to be careful that, that there isn't another simultaneous insert? All right. So why don't you tell the class, ask the class? I don't, I don't know. Oh, they may not have heard you since you were speaking to the wall. <laughs> I, is there a specific, uh, specific sy syntax you use to ensure that that insert doesn't clobber another insert or Bounce against another well, why don't you explain explain the situation in your in your view? Why is there? Why should it? I asked if there were no rows in the database. This returns zero, so I do the insert. So I'm only doing the insert if there's nothing in the database. Right, but that's coming after you do the check. So there might well, there exists the possibility that there might be another insert at the same time. If another copy of this code is running at exactly the same time. Right. Which it actually may. More often than you'd think, this happens, right? Because if the user clicks twice, then you get two threads started at almost exactly the same time with almost exactly the same, well, with exactly the same uh, get request. So yes, indeed, there is a concurrency problem because we are um, doing something in the database, not taking any locks, not excluding any copies of this code elsewhere. There's 
actual exclusion code in AOL server that we could use mutexes or I tend not to use them because I think that you ought to use the Oracle mechanisms for uh, exclusion. Then um, we check. So anytime you're, anytime that you basically get some information from the database, rely on it, and then do something to the database uh, without being inside a transaction block that takes appropriate locks, you're running a terrible risk that somebody else will be in there. Do the same query, find the same, learn the same thing that you learned. Hey, there's no row in there, and then take the same action. So I'll insert another row. Okay. Um, so, um, what if we change? this statement to this statement. Uh, you won't increase the click count if there is, uh, if you do find a row is created in between the two. Won't increase the click, oh. So, this so you're saying, you're saying that I could have a lost. Of one click count, right. Well, whoever simultaneously finds. I agree. Okay, I agree with that. First of all, let me show you what th this is doing. Uh, every database has some mechanism for you insert a row based on selecting some other stuff. So in this case, we're selecting from the Oracle system table called dual. And dual is a table that only has one row and one column. I think the value in there is X or something. So you don't, you never call dual. You do things like select sysdate from dual. You're not interested in the information that's in dual. It's just that there's no way in Oracle, other than a select, there's no way to return a value or call a function or put in constants like this. So basically, in this case, from the procedural code, we're supplying these three constants, this one, this one, this one, and then calling one Oracle function. And we're saying select those four constant values from dual, but and that'll get us one row, always. But if we add this where zero equals select count star from refer log, then that gives us either zero or one row. So basically, this will do the insert in the event that this count star returns zero, and it won't do the insert um, if uh, there's already a row in there. So this is actually a good technique if you have data model files and you're worried about, a lot of you guys I've seen have data model files where you're uh, doing an insert to put some test data into your database. Um, if you program them in this style, then you can keep loading them into your system. I, I, I think at least somebody in this room has probably had a problem with loading that twice and having to go and delete some of the data. Uh, this is a way to avoid that. You can make things that can be loaded multiple times without uh, without having uh, dup dupes put in. Okay. Um, how do you get rid of, let's say, let's say you're doing all this. Here's an example. Insert to refer log, you know, architectural slash garden photography from Yahoo. Um, if you want to get rid of the dupes, you can delete from the refer log, call that table one, where exists select one. So when you're using an exists, you're just looking for rows and it's conventional to, instead of saying select star or select some column from refer, refer log, to just select the constant. Because you're not, this signals to other SQL programmers that you're not interested in the values coming from this table. You're just interested in whether the rows exist. So get a report of one, 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 depending on how many rows exist. And so that's, like I said, it's conventional to, after you have the where exists clause, to have a select one. Um, so we're selecting from the same table. Oracle internally is probably going to turn this into some sort of join uh, rather than an actual recursive uh, subselect. Um, where the local URLs are the same, the foreign URLs are the same, but T1 row ID is greater than T2 row ID. This is this 
uh, pseudo column in Oracle that uniquely identifies a row in the database. It's, you say, hey, why, why, don't, why am I using all these generated keys? Why am I using all these integers when I could just use row ID for everything? Uh, it's a guaranteed unique thing that Oracle assigns to every row. The problem with it is it's not guaranteed um, to be preserved if you export your database and import it into another Oracle installation. So it's very bad taste to use row IDs. Um, we use it occasionally in ACS. For example, if you're looking at a page of stuff, um, we used to. We don't really do it anymore. And you say, okay, I want to delete this. Or actually sometimes for users, for alerts, for email alerts, we send them out this thing saying they can delete their email alert. And we include the row ID as kind of a code. And they have one click removal of their email alert by row ID. In that case, we're relying on the row ID to be stable for a few days, for maybe a few minutes if it's in a web session. Um, but that's not the same as uh, an integer key where you can rely on it being the same for 25 years. So, But it is awfully useful because it'll tell you these rows that look the same, they're actually different in row ID. They'll be, there's, they're guaranteed to be different in row ID. Um, let's see if I have a good... All right, let's go back to this. So as it happens... So we've all agreed that we're now safe from never having two... We're never going to have two rows with these same values, um, but we might lose an update. So this turns out to be wrong. Um, it turns out to be right in SQL Server and wrong in Oracle. It's a very, very subtle bug. And this is why the database eggheads will tell you that Oracle sucks. Okay, I told you why Oracle is what everybody uses on the web, certainly, and also in the rest of the world, generally. It's because readers don't wait for writers, and writers don't wait for readers. So we talked about this, right? If the marketing guy is doing a two-hour-long query and somebody else wants to do updates um, in SQL Server, that blocks for two hours, so nobody can do any updating on those tables and rows and so forth. Uh, whereas in Oracle, um, the people who are doing updates and selects and so forth proceed merrily along, and the marketing guy is seeing an older snapshot of the, of the database. He sees a snapshot uh, from when the query was started. All right, so how does that work here? How do we get, how do we screw ourselves this way? Well, this turns into a do the select, see what happens, and then do the insert. So like I said, I have a feeling that if this were SQL Server, selecting count star would scan through every row and refer log and lock them all. So nobody else, other people could read them, other SQL Server users could read them, but nobody else could write into the database during that time. And then um, SQL Server would say, okay, I'm happy, so I'll do this insert. Uh, but during that whole session, everybody else was excluded. Um, I'm not quite sure that would work, actually, even in SQL Server, because, of course, we're only looking at a portion of the database. So I could be wrong. Um, but in Oracle, this definitely doesn't take enough locks to protect yourself. Because what happens is this transaction, let's say we have two transactions that start at exactly the same time. They both are essentially, for the purposes of reading, they're both handed snapshots of the database as it existed when their transaction started. So they both do this select, find that there's nothing there, and they both do the insert, and everybody's happy except you now have two rows in your database for the same uh, local URL, foreign URL, and entry date. So how could you fix this problem? Any other ideas? Let's go back to the data model. Local URL combination via primary key. 
What do you guys think of that idea? You're not going to keep your job as a SQL programmer <laughs> if you do stuff like that. It's like uh, there was this day in the life of cyberspace project with these Solaris machines, and I don't know, it was the sun's bug, or they said the machine's wrong, but I think I mentioned this, right? They were leaking a, gig a gigabyte of memory per hour in the operating system and had to reboot their machines, so it's not the kind of thing you want to put on your resume. <laughs> Implemented Perl script cron job that ran every hour to reboot machine to deal with memory leaks. <laughs> it's not what you'd really call a glorious engineering achievement. So yeah, let's talk about primary keys. So if we had constrained this instead of just creating an index on those three, if instead we had declared those three to be the primary key, like I said, I'm not going to speak for other databases, but I know in Oracle that creates as a side effect the index that we want. So queries will be just as fast. And it also causes enough locks to be taken that Oracle um, will probably try both of those, but one of them will fail and result in an error. So again, you'd have to, if you really wanted to make your application, um, if you want to make sure you never lost an update, you'd have to catch, you have to be prepared for the idea that, that insert could generate an error, catch it, and then turn it back into an update. So you'd have update. To be efficient, I think the, the thing that I, um, had written below here is actually the right way to code something like this, some code that has to be high efficiency. You try the update because, you know, not 199 times out of two, there's a, oftentimes a couple hundred of these per day. The count will rack up to a couple hundred. So 199 times, this is the correct operation to do. You might as well try it. See if it fails. Then do the insert. See if that errors out by putting a catch around it. Um, and then go and do the update again. So pretty gnarly code, but you know, again, um, you know, you're not entitled to uh, have every part of your system be clean if you also want it to be fast. So you did put a unique constraint on, or uh, make those three a primary key. Primary I primary contrived key. this example merely for pedagogy. I would never have made a mistake like this myself and resulted in a <laughs> buttload of duplicate rows in the photo.net database. <laughs> yeah. Took a few hours to clean them out. I'm not putting and notice it is not on my resume. <laughs> One of my engineering achievements. So uh, I don't know if this is interesting to you guys, but uh, well, here it is anyway. So I thought it'd be worth seeing how these database management systems work a little bit, because um, this is, like I said, the database lecture. So Oracle has. And Postgres is completely different, and there, therefore it is pig slow. So the Postgres thing is quite a bit slicker in some ways, but it is uh, unacceptably slow. And, and Oracle, the whole point of relational databases, when IBM developed them around 1970, um, and I guess they had a working implementation a few years later, System R, the, uh, the idea was that, okay, this is great, this is what users want, but it's too slow to be useful, so they would never ship it. Oracle slapped something together, uh, I guess made it maybe a little faster than IBM's or maybe not, whatever. They just shipped it out the door, and that's how they got market dominance. But still, they've been fighting with their big enterprise customers. They've been fighting this problem year after year that nobody thinks that a relational database is really fast enough. And if you want to do real database management, you have to use some ancient you know, vSAM-based system on your mainframe. So there's a tremendous amount of um, complexity in Oracle aimed at making the thing just run wildly fast. OK. Um, and how fast can you get? I think there's a FedEx. I think FedEx has been testing Oracle to see if they can just convert everything over to standard Unix machines running Oracle. I think they managed to set up a fairly moderate-sized machine. And they've been doing 200 transactions per second 
every second for the last year. <laughs> Just testing this thing. Um, so they have gotten it to work. And they never lost a transaction. Where losing a transaction doesn't mean that you know, Oracle commits it. I guess they're not, they're not concerned that Oracle will commit a transaction and they won't be able to find it again. Uh, to them, losing a transaction means that it, it gets uh, kicked back. The database isn't available. Um, that it errors out or something like that. So they're doing pretty well, I think. All right. That is a great company, though, FedEx. They have you know, the best corporate IT department probably of any company. Um, you know, For your, the Oracle installations that you set up, uh, it's not clear how long you could go. <laughs> um, all right. How does Oracle work? I guess let's start with the user process. So here's your SQL plus section, session, or here's AOL server. It makes a connection. Um, this is a little bit extra complexity. Um, the best way to think about it is there's a, a dedicated server process for each user. Oh, here, here's the example. The user process talks to the dedicated server process. When we run 6916 at MIT and we have uh, 15 AOL servers and 15 students, all on the same machine. We use something called Oracle multi-threaded server where there's only one Unix process that serves all those clients. But the classical Oracle way of doing things is one user process, one server process. Um, again, they're typically on different machines, but they could be on the same machine. Okay, the server process has access to this big cache of buffers, uh, blocks basically from the database. Um, and what happens is that if you're doing a query, the data files may get pulled from the database, stuffed into the buffer cache, and then uh, the information served back to you. You have this lock manager here, which keeps you from fighting with other people for the same uh, locations in the buffer cache. This is all in memory, by the way. That's how you deal with C programs. You would just wait till they crash and then you restart them and hope that nobody notices. Um, the interesting thing that happens is once you update one of these buffers. Okay, so you're doing a transaction. You're going to have to update. Um, you're going to have to update what's in the database. So you start by taking the old value and copying it to something called the rollback segment. So the old, so if you screw up, uh, you can always get the old values back from the rollback segment. Um, then you write what you're going to change into the memory here, and you also write information into what's called the redo log. So the redo log is fundamentally the record of the transaction. That's the most important thing in Oracle, is a log of what you've changed. So it's not the whole block. It's just enough about the block to specify you know, which parts of the database you've actually updated. When the transaction commits, the transaction doesn't commit until that information is written out to the hard drive. And there's interesting things about Oracle. It can do block commits. I forget what they're called, actually, or group commits somehow. If there's 50 simultaneous users all doing an update at roughly the same time, Oracle is smart enough to keep all their stuff together in memory and then just, just, just do a single disk write. So you can get hugely better performance than you might expect from maybe just running a Perl script and looping around on your own machine. You actually can get, um, it can group up these transactions and commit them all at once and then get back to all 50 of those users saying, oh, I just committed your transaction. Notice that here's these data files. Notice that I did not say that when your process does a transaction for you, it writes the data file back to the hard drive. Sorry, the, uh, the, the, that one block from the data file back from the hard drive. And you might say, well, that sounds pretty darn screwed up. If any of us here in this room wrote a database, we would do the obvious thing. You update it in memory. And now it's dirty, so you uh, write it back to the hard drive for persistence, and then you commit the transaction. Well, that's sort of how Postgres works, actually. And it turns out to be just too slow. 
Uh, it's just too slow to build something that simple, stupid way. Basically, if you do that, you're writing random locations on the disk, which is very, very slow. Whereas the redo log is sequential writes to the disk. You're just writing this continuously growing log file, and you're just writing round and round on this disk drive. So you might say, well, what if this goes on for half a day, and none of my data files get updated, and then my database crashes? So now I lose the memory, or I have to reboot my Solaris machine because it's leaked a gigabyte of RAM. Um, so now I have to reboot. I lose all that information in memory. OK, well, what happens then is you turn your computer back on. It wakes up Oracle. Oracle says, hmm, let's look at the last checkpoint, the checkpoint process. It says the last checkpoint was at midnight. Now it's noon. So now I'm going to have to dig into the redo logs. I have what's on my hard drive, and I have this disk record of everything that I changed. So now I'm going to reach into the redo logs, and I'm going to roll forward 12 hours worth of transactions. Now, if you're at FedEx, rolling forward 12 hours of transactions is probably going to take you, you know, eight hours because <laughs> you're, you know, using your machines to the fullest. So this is a disadvantage of this architecture, that if you do have frequent crashes, the roll forward project means your database is unavailable for a long, long time. And this makes people unhappy. So Postgres, actually, the Postgres architecture, it's called no overwrite. They are all constantly writing new blocks <laughs> to the actual data files. And then um, when you need to do a query, it just goes and looks for the most recent uh, blocks in that table. But you know, like I said, it's way, way slow. Um, but it means that you don't have to roll forward on restart. All right, so Oracle deals with this. You can put a lower bound on how much, um, an upper bound, excuse me, on how much pain you're going to have to roll forward by specifying in your configuration file how often everything is checkpointed. So when a checkpoint comes along, you take all your dirty buffers and you write them back to the uh, data files. So I'm not sure what typical is, but you know something like an hour is certainly quite reasonable or 15 minutes or whatever, and then it'll do this little flurry of uh, disk activity every now and then to make sure that everything's kept up to date. So that's pretty much how Oracle works. Um, it's kind of an interesting system. It's amazing that they got it to work. I don't know if this is interesting. Uh, I guess it is interesting. All right, so this is basically your data blocks. They're grouped into extents. The extents are grouped into segments. Each table gets its own segment. I don't know why they came up with this little hierarchy, but they did. Uh, each index also gets its own segment. An interesting thing is that the rows try to stay into within a block. You can configure your block size. In the ancient Oracle world, 2K blocks was standard. Now 8K blocks are probably more standard. For data warehousing, 32K blocks are probably standard. Um, you don't want your blocks to be too huge because, remember, if you need to read something like a little drib or drab about one customer, you can only pull a block at a time from the database. And uh, also when you're doing updates and writing back uh, after a checkpoint, you can only write blocks back to the data file. So you know, if you have one gigabyte blocks, then your, uh, the granularity, your updates of, say, one number are going to start costing you a tremendous amount of disk access and memory. All right, so here's a block. You try to keep the rows within the block. Percent free says that we're only going to update this row until we get to 80% full. We leave 20%, I guess this is header information and so forth up at the top, waste, wasted space. So here's your data. Here's your 20% free. And you keep 20% free because if you do an update rather than an insert, you may need to grow your row a little bit as, say, a varchar goes from 10 bytes to 200 bytes. Somebody you know, gets married and develops a hyphenated last name that's going to grow their last name field a bit. So that happens within that free space. Um, updates also cause this to shrink. But once it shrinks down below the 80% mark, Oracle will not do um, new inserts. 
there's another parameter, I forget, it might be called percent used or something. Uh, it'll only start doing new inserts rather than updates when the amount of used space falls below, say, 40%. These are all defaults, you can configure them. Again, for a data warehouse in installation, you'd probably be smart to set percent free to zero or something like that because you're writing all these blocks, it's settable per table as well. So in the data warehouse, you're storing old data um, and uh, once you write the data for yesterday, you're never going to touch it again. So you might as well pack it into the blocks as tightly as possible and not have all these holes in your cache. Um, and therefore, you set the percent free differently. On a transaction processing system, you're always going to want some free space so that an update to a row doesn't cause it to have to migrate to another block. All right. So those, that's how the storage structures work. On the high level, there's these things called table spaces. I think we mentioned this before. Here's two physical disk drives. Um, they are data files. A data file is associated with only one table space. Um, however, a table space like users can consist of three separate data files. And oh, actually, that's sorry, two separate data files or one data file that it keeps getting extended. Um, by the file system. So if you have a file system that can store really big files, you can keep everything in one file and then keep extending it. Uh, that's not a great solution, I guess, because they won't be contiguous, but might be okay. So you can always alter table space, system, add data file. You can add these data files at any time. And the data files can be on different hard drives. So you could have a table space with data files on six different hard drives. That's not a very good idea because you want to have a pretty good idea when somebody says, it's in the foobar table space, which physical disk that's on. If you keep your table and the index for that table on separate physical hard drives, as we mentioned uh, earlier, an update to that table has to also update the index. So those writes will be happening on different hard drives and you'll get higher performance because you won't have to uh, serialize all your disk writes for one disk drive. Um, Here's the B tree index that you've been creating. And again, SQL Server probably has something very similar uh, where you say, okay, if it's less than king, go down here. If it's uh, less than Blake, go down here. Well, okay, if it's between Blake and James, go over here. Um, and if you look at what's inside here, you find that say B Lake Blake, sorry, Clark and Ford, these three values map to particular row IDs and then it can go look into the um, segment for the table and pull out those individual rows. So an index lookup for say Ford is going to chase one, two, three places in the index and then a fourth place in the table rather than uh, go chase through every row in the table. Uh, a weird thing that Oracle does with the B-tree index, it's not a real B-tree index because these leaf nodes are all linked, which is not true in a textbook B-tree. And it does that because if you ask for the maximum or the minimum, or you say select star from this table, order by this column, uh, and it wants to just chug through the row IDs, it can do that by you know starting here and going chug, 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 chug until you get tired and flush your cursor. The other weird thing you can do is an index organized table. You can say, basically, my table doesn't have a whole lot of data in it, doesn't have any fancy data types. Um, I only, I'm always going to be accessing it this one way. So in that case, why not just have the whole table be the index? So augment these blocks. In addition to storing row ID, they can also store a few numbers, some var chars. And now you have an index organized table, which gives you rapid access, and you don't duplicate uh, the keys in two places on the disk. Okay, multi-versioning. So this is the kind of thing that we were talking about earlier that was actually screwing us in the case of the um, uh, referrer log, but is helping us most of the time. So basically, if you start your select at time one, uh, 10,023, which is some kind of internal Oracle transaction timer, um, you go chugging along through the table uh, blocks, which again are going to be in RAM generally. Um, and you find, okay, 
Here's a couple blocks that were modified at time 10,021. So I'll just read those. Here's a block that got updated at time 10,024. So after I started my query, well, I'm not supposed to see that. I don't even know what's in there. I don't care. I'm going to go into the rollback segment and pull out the, la the most recent value of that same block. So here I find one, the most recent one, I guess, was modified at 10,008. So I'll query the rows from this one instead, and then go back to scanning the um, main table, duck back out to the rollback segment, go back here. Um, and so I will always get the snapshot of the database as it existed at 10,023. Okay, so what's the problem with this implementation? Are we in fairyland now? Are we happy? Can we can we still get screwed? Aside from the transaction problem we saw earlier, what's the problem? What's the potential problem with this? <coughs> Will this always work? I can tell you that Oracle always writes a rollback segment because in case a transaction fails, it does need the old unmodified values of the blocks. Um, if, well, if the same data block gets updated twice since 10,023, yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll find the most recent that is uh, at, at the same time earlier than your system change number for the start of the query. So what kind of a new error message does the database have to have in its arsenal because of this architecture? Can't get to the rollback somehow. Why couldn't it get to the rollback? Is it ever possible that the system checkpoints and updates things while you're still? Not generally. I mean, it runs around in the rollback segment, but you guys are on the right track. <coughs> I will tell you that there are queries that take 24 hours to run at various database shops. So how does that affect your thinking? 24-hour query. A lot of transactions. Yeah, so if you, unless your rollback segment is infinite in size, there's some possibility that you'll have filled it up. Um, so basically, I don't see any infinite size hard drives at Micro Center. Um, at least not last time I was there. <laughs> so uh, you get this error message called you can get an er you can get an error message called snapshot too old. We actually got this. Uh, there's a company called Job Direct that run this huge overnight spamming pr uh, program to spam their students who had load uploaded resumes into the thing about um, what uh, jobs were available for them anyway. And I guess a lot of these students would update their resumes and things in the middle of the night. Uh, the rows were huge because, you know, there was, I don't know, maybe 200 columns per student just in the main table alone, plus a lot of other stuff. So any kind of update to your resume would result in a whole lot of database uh, action and the rollback segments would fill up. And then so a couple hours into this spamming job, they would sometimes get snapshot too old and they had to add another gigabyte or so to the rollback segments. So it does happen. Yeah, this is why Oracle DBAs get paid a lot of money. Because if you don't set that up properly, you're uh, screwed. All right, so basically, um, Oracle actually has, so there's basically, um, there's a notion in the database nerd world of serializability of can your transaction execute as if nobody else is there, even though, in fact, uh, other people are being served. So what does that mean? The database isn't just working for you. It's working for all these other people at the same time. And that has potentially horrifying consequences. Two people reading the same value from the database, relying on it, and then issuing an update. So like I said, the way that uh, other databases the way that the classical database deals with this is lock, 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 lock. If you're reading, you block writers. If you're writing, you block readers. And uh, they get serializability by essentially serializing all access to the database. So that might work. 
So here's what happens. I'm going to read this to you because it's kind of fuzzy. It's from Oracle Docs, obviously. Um, you read row one and block one. Then you update row one and block one. This guy, meanwhile, has uh, updated row two in block one. Um, but you're going to read the old row because you, you guys started at the same time and therefore you know your transaction B, you're not allowed to see anything that A has done. So you get the old row's value. Um, if you try to update that value, however, you will fail. You will fail because Oracle realizes that even though this guy is committed and he's out of the database, it realizes that you have um, presumably been relying, since you started at the same time, because you set transactional isolation level serial, serializable, um, it realizes, hey, that other row got updated. Before you updated it, you probably were reading it and relying on its old value. So I'm just not going to let you do that. I'm going to roll. I'm going to abort you and roll you back. So as it says, failure on attempt to update row updated and committed since transaction B began. So that's fundamentally what. That's not the default behavior. No. Can't you end up in a sort of endless two of those fighting each other, trying to get? Restarting and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you get two serializable things going at the same time. They just keep. Yeah, I mean, basically, Oracle is mostly foolproof, in the sense that you know, if you do the market, the two-hour-long marketing query, you're not going to cause a denial of service attack on your own site. Um, but it's still the case that, you know, designing a transaction processing system does require careful thinking about locks and concurrency and serializability. It's, it's. Uh, well, although plenty of people do it without thinking. <laughs> so yeah, there's interesting situations though that this really doesn't prevent. So basically, um, you know, in a in a tree hierarchy, you know, one transaction could say, "Aha, this tree node exists, so I'll insert some child rows underneath it, and then commit the work." And here I'm going to say, "Well, let's read some child rows. I don't find any." So I'll delete the parent and then you know, commit that. So basically, if you have referential integrity constraints of some sort, uh, at some point, one of these transactions would get aborted for violating referential integrity. But if you're just doing this you know, with integers and you know, you're keeping track of the integrity of the, your data structure, then you could do some pretty horrific things, even with um, serializability, because you're not talking about you know the specific same rows in the database, right? All, all Oracle knows is, you know, row two and block one, and that was updated and committed since I started. So I don't like that. Oh, what else did I have to say? Poking around inside Oracle, uh, I hope you guys have found the data dictionary, but you know it gives you things like there's a table called user tables. And you can select table name from that, and you can see all the tables that you've defined. There's a whole bunch of data dictionary tables that are fun to look at. Um, where are the user views? I guess they're coming up. But they're the same as the all views. So for example, user tab columns. Oops, I guess I should really look at all tab columns. User tab columns tells you the column name, the data type, the data length uh, for a particular table. So there's going to be one row in this table user in this all, all tab columns or user tab columns for every column that you've ever defined in every table in your system. So every database has this, and you can go and inspect it. Uh, what else is interesting? There is an interesting table that you often have to look at. Uh, is it cons tab constraints? Maybe it's all constraints. No, I think it's all cons columns. Yeah, so this one is interesting. Um, this is a check constraint in a table, a primary key, the search condition, who owns it. If you get 
aborted because of violating referential integrity, you actually have to go, unless you have some fancy GUI tool, you basically have to go uh, poking around in the data dictionary to find out, you know, it'll, it'll tell you the auto-generated name of the constraint, maybe like C00, whatever. You have to go into this table and find the constraint name and then read information about it. It's pretty horrific. You can't set a custom name for a constraint? Anymore. You can set a custom name for the constraint, but of course if some other program created it and they called it, you know, Bob's constraint, um, you know, right back to your data dictionary, <laughs> see what it actually does. But you're right, it's good, considered good taste, although I don't do it, to name all your constraints. Because <sighs> the system error messages are quite uninformative. Anyway, the sign of one sign of a good database programmer is that you always know um, where to go look at look in your data dictionary. Tuning, I don't know how much I want to dwell on tuning today. Um, just to say that basically you do have to think about this a bit. You gotta know what to do when your query is running too slowly and think about adding indices. In the Oracle world you can set auto trace on which will tell you what's happening. So here's, we're trying to query for, um, you know, users who've requested a page within 600 seconds. We can be pretty sure that, you know, creating an index on last visit is gonna speed up our query. Ugh, here's some horrible cases. Well, anyway, here's some output from the auto trace, it tells you, you know, we're having to do an index range scan of vboard by topic. That's a good thing to see. Then we're gonna do table access by index row ID and then do some sorting. So that's a pretty happy execution plan. Um, still not as good as you might think because we're still doing 10,000 physical disk reads. That's just for one query? Yeah. Um, it's not a very selective index, I guess, B-board by topic. Yeah, so that's the problem. There were 14,000 messages in the photo.net one, so it still had to go through 14,000 messages. Um, if you see this, table access full, game over. Very, very bad. Um, this shows creating the index in a separate table space. Um, if we index it by the subject line um, and analyze the table so Oracle computes some statistics and sees what's, um, what's more selective, right? Because un until you've, once you've uh, done an analyzed table and it can build a histogram of the values, it can't really tell um, what's worth using. So now we can get this down to three physical reads because it's uh, looking at the B-board index by one line instead. This is to see if, a, if the user is double clicking if a message is already in there. Which is not a great way to do things, by the way. A better way to prevent double click is just to issue the primary key of some sort in the form that the user is using to submit. And then if they double click, you can see that it's already in the database. Um, your database will never let the second one go in. That has the disadvantage that the user can't clear out the form and reuse it to submit something else. but. If you come up with your page flow, right, the typical way to build <coughs> typical way to build web systems is you issue a form that say a static HTML page, user types whatever uh, he or she wants, hit submit, then you have a script that generates a key. I'm sure you've all written this, right? Generates a key, does the insert, returns a happy HTML page to the user. So the problem with that script is there's nothing to keep you from running 100 of those at exactly the same time for exactly the same user. Whereas if instead of giving the user a static HTML form, you generate a key using a sequence, uh, put that into a hidden variable in the form, user types, hit submits, now you run a script that checks to see if that thing's already in the database. If it is, it can return a happy uh, confirmation page to the user as if uh, nothing had happened, or you can handle it else where you can say, well, you probably double clicked, click over here to check the status of all your orders or the status of all your postings, see if you find it, um, 
and uh, otherwise move on. But you know that you'll never get two submissions from the same form if you do that. But it all depends on, like I said, dynamically generating your forms. Well, for the primary key, as an explicit variable in that form, doesn't that complete a little trick anyway? Does a primary key as an explicit variable? Um, well, <coughs> email address is not unique on photo.net, right? You're allowed to have 10 classified ads from the same email address. So that's just an example. Let's say there was a unique key that was being specified in the form. Well, that's my point. If you have a static HTML page, then there isn't going to be a unique key in there, right? You're serving the same page to every user on your system. So that's my point. You put the classified ad ID into the submission form, and the, the disadvantage there is you lose keys. You can have holes in your system because um, a lot of your keys aren't going to be used. The user says, oh, I don't want to post a classified ad. Now, fortunately, Oracle, you know, an Oracle sequence goes up to about 10 to the 40th. So uh, <laughs> not that big a deal. All right, anyway, the tuning chapter is there. I do recommend having a look at it because, again, that's part of the art of being a real database engineer is knowing how to poke around, see what your system's doing, I don't know. Have you guys, you guys haven't played with any similar tools on SQL Server, have you? There's a profiler. Okay. What's it called? Profiler. <laughs> Clever. All right. Uh, in the Oracle world, there is this designing and tuning for performance doc that uh, is a lot better than mine, obviously, although it's more verbose. Anyway, actually, it's not that much better than mine. It doesn't have too many good examples. Maybe they have a few. Um, all right. Well, we're basically done for today, I think. Um, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but I will be here on Sunday. Uh, i got to go to Dallas. It'll be interesting. I'm giving my one-day talk. I wonder if anybody's going to ask, hey, what about that Slashdot story? 